Welcome back. I have the pleasure and the honor to introduce our next speaker, Mr. Cameron Chisholm, President of International Peace and Security Institute. He is the President uh, and Founder of the International Peace and Security Institute, IPSI. He has extensive experience in program management for international participants and a career focused on global peace and security issues and was recently named as one of the top 99 under 33 most influential global foreign professional, policy professional. Prior to founding IPSI, he was a global security analyst at the World Bank in Washington, D.C., focusing on South Asia and global crisis response. He was an international program director for a DC-based nonprofit recruiting participant in designing curricula for international conflict resolution symposia globally. He also acted as an independent consultant on conflict resolution initiative for multiple DC-based organizations. As a Rotary World Peace Fellow at the University of Bradford in the UK, he earned his MA in International Politics and Security Studies. He has a BA from Emory University, where he worked in the Conflict Resolution Program at the Carter Center. Cameron is an Associate Fellow at the Truman National Security Project. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Hi, I know we're running late, and so we'll try and keep this quick and light because I know it's before lunch, and I don't know if you guys have had your mid-morning coffees yet, and I don't want to run into your lunch time. Uh, so I think we're going to switch gears a little bit uh, on what many of the other people have been talking about. I know it's been a lot of meta issues. Uh, and what I'm really interested in talking to you guys about, and I mean talking, I, I don't want to sit up here and lecture you guys um, because there's a lot of knowledge in the room, so I'm hoping we can make this a little interactive, is how is the individual a, a, uh, a power for peace, how as we as individuals can be diplomats, we as individuals uh, can be purveyors of soft power, and we as individuals can be peacemakers. Because when you come to soft power, or you talk about soft power, you talk about diplomacy, it really is just a group of individuals who are working towards an end goal. So we can't talk about how to do that without talking about the individuals that make it up. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about the International Peace and Security Institute, what we do. Um, I want to ask some questions. I want to talk to you guys about what you perceive the, the proper skills are for uh, an effective diplomat, an effective world leader. Uh, and then maybe we can get some lessons learned at the end and, and some takeaways and, and we'll go change the world. Sound, sound ambitious enough for 20 minutes? Yeah? All right, good. Um, so I'm going to tell you sort of how I came to what I'm doing, my, my personal experience. Um, and believe me, it's not like profound or anything. I didn't come to any profound realizations that anybody else already didn't come to a thousand times. Uh, but mine was in 2007. Um, and at the time, I was working with the conflict early warning system in East Africa. Uh, and I was living in Addis Ababa. And uh, I had just been lucky that I was the only native English speaker uh, working for EGAD at the time, which is the Intergovernmental Authority on Development. And they were doing the official lessons learned for the Sudanese CPA and the 14th Somali peace process. So I was deep into my master's degree. I was looking at peace and security architecture. I was looking at human security and the operationalization of you know, all that jargon. Uh, and I went down to Kenya and I sat in a room for a week with all of the EGAD ministers, all of the people who had mediated the conflicts and absolutely nothing that I had learned in my master's degree helped me at all in that room. And it had absolutely nothing to do with what they were talking about. Uh, and I was like, oh, oh. Yeah. <laughs> oh, expletive. I'm screwed. Uh, I'm, I'm never going to achieve anything, and this has all been a huge waste of my time. Um, but one of the interesting things that I took away was that even these senior ministers were talking about how they felt like they didn't have the skills to, to be effective. You know, we need to be trained in mediation. We need to be trained in negotiation. We need to be trained in facilitation. If I, if I had been trained in mediation, I would have done something differently. If I, under, you know, if I had read Bill Urey, I would have done something differently, you know, if I knew how to get to yes and didn't treat everything as, a, uh, as sort of a zero-sum game. So I, my kind of profound moment, which was not profound at all, um, was sitting at this little plastic table uh, at the Addis Ababa Golf Club in their little, I don't know if any of you spent time there, it's, it's, it sounds a lot fancier than it is, it's not fancy, um, where I was staying at the guest house, 
And it was, wow, there's a really big gap between theory and practice. You know, there's, there's really big, I mean, and that's what I'm saying, it's not profound. A million people had said that to me, but it, that was when it actually like sunk in. And, and I said, okay, well, at this little table, I started writing down, okay, if, there's, if there is this gap, we should probably do something about it. Uh, and, and how do I myself start training myself towards being a more effective leader and wrote down, you know, the different skills that I thought probably I needed. And then I heard that these, these, you know, really important people were talking about. And then I started researching. Okay, how do I get these skills? And I found that it was really difficult to get these skills. So there's a training in Spain for three days, and then there's a training in, in Cape Town, and then there's something at Canada. And like, I'm, I'm a student, I'm not a millionaire, I can't fly around the world. And, and, and these trainings aren't coordinated, you, you don't know who the trainers are. Uh, a lot of times they're just, they're also just theoreticians talking about what the theory. Uh, so then I started designing the trainings that I would wanna go to. Uh, and eventually that turned into the International Peace and Security Institute. Because I said, well, you know, as I talked to friends, people were like, well, I'd like to go to that training. I, I'd like to do that. Um, and, and it started me on what has now become a passion of mine, which is bridging the gap between theory and practice. And really focusing not on current leaders, but focusing on future leaders. Uh, and focusing on those people who are going to be in positions of power. So when we're in those lessons learned, they're not saying, if only I had been trained in mediation then maybe, or if only I had been trained in negotiation. It was, I was trained, and so I did things correctly this time. Um, so uh, that's what Ipsy does. We can talk about it you know, afterwards. I won't go into all of our programs. Um, but I'm gonna talk about one thing that's really exciting uh, that we're actually working with SICE on and then State Department in a minute, but we'll get there. But before that, I kinda wanna open up to you guys. And, and in your experiences, I'm always interested to know what are the practical skills that you think someone in the soft power, someone in the diplomatic corps, someone who is a peace builder, who's head of NGO, what are the skills that you think they need? And just shout them out. Language skills? Language skills? And what do you mean by cultural sensitivity? So being aware of yourself and being aware of, of others and, and how that the sort of self and others interact. Okay, yeah, perfect. Listening skills, active listening. Tact. Tact. Diplomacy. But what does that mean? <laughs> the, the way to say something or to present your thoughts to somebody. The way you say something that it's not demeaning or demoralizing, but trying to understand and being. Cultural sensitivity. Understanding. Yes. Yeah, exactly. The communication skills. Perfect. Others? Perfect. A knowledge. You're not just parachuting in and being like, hey, guess what? I'm the American. I showed up and we, we're amazing. <laughs> and you should learn from us. Yes, exactly. Uh, formal training and experience in things like uh, empathy as a skill, mm -hmm. uh, dialogue, cooperation, etc. Absolutely. Good. I think that's, that's a good start uh, since we're not going to go into lunchtime. Um, and, and on top of that, I think that there are some other skills that are really important. Uh, I've mentioned it, I think mediation skills are really important. I think negotiation skills are really important. Um, I think also knowledge of things like strategic nonviolent action is very important. I think program planning and design is really important. I think even more so it's being recognized that trauma healing is very, very important. Um, as most of you know, I'm sure a lot of your friends are alcoholics um, because we jump into these really crazy conflict situations and there's no post-traumatic stress uh, counseling for us. Uh, when we get, you know, and we have, are making decisions where it's life or death for people. Um, and there's not a recognition in that. Um, and so we need to recognize how we're traumatized and how we're dealing with traumatized populations and how they interact. Um, there is so many other skills. We need to understand how international justice, we need to understand economics, we need to understand how everything works. I think we're the only field in the world where it's kind of like, you kind of have to understand everything uh, in order to really be effective um, and, and so in our trainings and in our skills, we really try and train towards that. So we usually do, you know, 10, 12 hours a day. The people who run our trainings are the, the top people in the world on the topic. Uh, we, we overcome the issue in the fact that a lot of the trainings that we go to, it's like all with students or it's, it's all with some professionals. So we try and do a really strong mix of people from different countries, uh, from different backgrounds. So there's a lot of peer learning as well. Um, so that's a little bit about what we do. Um, and I remember when I first started Ipsy, and this is only four years ago, people were kind of like, eh, whatever. You know, you, if you talk to like the, the government leaders, or, oh, we, we kind of do what we do. 
Uh, this doesn't really have a lot to do with diplomacy. Um, peace doesn't have anything to do with entrepreneurship. Uh, you know, these things where I'm like, what are you, are you kidding me? Like, who? but I think perceptions are changing. Um, and I've seen some really concrete ways that per perceptions are changing uh, among governments, among institutions, uh, among uh, the general population that's saying, okay, we do understand that there has to be some sort of a bridge between the gap of theory and practice. Um, I have a list that I wrote down before I came in of how I'm seeing it, but I would be also interested if you guys agree with me. Do you think that there's a, a change in perception now when people are focusing on skills? Yeah, you can say no. It's okay. Not enough? Not enough? I, what are, I'd love to hear some examples from you guys of how you've, if you have seen it, because this is something obviously I'm passionate about and I'm always trying to hear about more things, um, but if you've seen some sort of a specific change in people's perceptions, especially at the government level, focusing on more practical skills training for um, for our diplomats, for uh, for people who are ahead of, not even even non-governmental, whatever. Yeah. Okay, I, I did a little study when I was a first year, and I found that um, an increasing number of ambassadors are chosen from a business background. Hmm. So their their skills are not only specialized but but business related. Okay, well, my experience is a little bit convoluted. Uh, I graduated from American in 2011, and my first job out of college was working at the Smithsonian American History Museum in their public programs department. So um, as an intern in my last semester of college, I did all this research on this program. And then they, I was hired on in part to facilitate the program. And it was about an American history topic, John Brown's right on Harper's Ferry. And uh, I got to go into a room with museum visitors, so general public people from all over the world, and facilitate a dialogue hmm. about the raid on Harper's Ferry and like the historical implications and was he crazy, was he right, you know, all those different things. But it was very informal, but I have to say that it was a platform for me to really develop those skills. And I think that if the Smithsonian is giving entry level people like myself the opportunity to talk to anyone around the world about it, it's pretty awesome. And how do you, do you think that the people learned more from you because it was a more of experiential sort of educational model? Yeah, I mean, it was a just conversation. A model? Yeah, absolutely. So you feel like they, they walked away? Yeah, more. it's a whole transition in museum mm -hmm. programming instead of putting information out at people and rather engaging them in conversation. Right. And well, let's, I, I think, let's switch gears real quickly. And why do you think, so I think perceptions are changing. Why do you guys think perceptions are changing? What? Right, right. Entrepreneurship. <laughs> if it doesn't work, you've got to try something different. But, but what, what's not working? What do, can you guys think of some specific things that have especially happened in the last five to ten years? that have changed the way that suddenly we're looking at soft power? That we're looking at, at diplomacy differently? And technology, right? The democratization of, of information. So it's, information is no longer top down from, from governments as it used to be in the, the entire history of basically the world, now it's top up. Uh, and, that, and we can have actually citizen engagement on a, on a, on a lateral level that doesn't have to go through governments, which is something that's that's changed a lot. Yeah, please there's... use the mic because otherwise we. Sorry, <laughs> I'm giving you your exercise. That's right. yeah. Increased immigration and emigration, and with that, the import and export of different cultures and ethnic backgrounds. Right, easy global movement. And I think when it comes to the American government, we also have to look at. Uh, what I think is broadly viewed as the failed policies of the past administration when it comes to how we engaged, especially in war. Um, and, and, and especially after 2008, uh, when suddenly we didn't have any money anymore. Uh, so, okay, so we still have to engage in foreign policy. We still have to, to uh, make a difference in the world, but we don't have as much money to do it. Um, we don't, uh, we see that the way that we did engage, which was sort of you're with us or against us, didn't work at all. Um, we found that we weren't actually dealing with actors on a sort of mutual level. Uh, and, and so suddenly, okay, so we were in a really bad position when it comes to soft power, uh, you know, circa 2006. And, and it wouldn't be the entire Bush administration. I, I know there are probably Democrats and Republicans out there. The last two years of the Bush administration, they, they started changing uh, once I think they got the, 
the, uh, the old guard, the neoconservatives, uh, out um, and became less ideological and more, more uh, logical, more pragmatic. Um, so with all of this, uh, we've got the, the, the change we need. We've got a changing perception. Uh, we've reached this point right now where, okay, we have a lot of options. We're having conferences like this. We're actually talking about soft power. So, so what's next? You know, what are the next things that we need to do? What, what are the next steps that we need to take to be more effective as individuals, as leaders uh, in this field rather than in the meta levels? What do you guys think? Uh, studying uh, actual applications of soft power and therein hopefully systematizing them, you know, finding out definitively by some objective measure what works, what doesn't. Great. Self-reflection. Um, there's something to be said about how um, education programs are actually structured. I'm lucky enough to attend a master's program where classes are very concentrated. I only attend classes over the summer. And then throughout the rest of the year, we have opportunities to really immerse in uh, practical experiences. So rethinking how education mm -hmm. programs are actually structured to incorporate more practical experience. Absolutely. All right, well, I can tell you about one thing that's, that's uh, kind of exciting, and I'll, cl and I'll close with that, and we can ask some questions and, and whatever. Um, so one of the things that, that we're working on right now uh, that's exciting and new uh, when it comes to exactly this field is experiential trainings for foreign service officers, for diplomats. Um, the Foreign Service Institute is a wonderful institution, uh, but like a lot of government institutions, it's slower to change. Um, and, and a lot of the education models are... are are very similar to they were, you know, a decade ago. Um, but there are some very entrepreneurial characters that have entered into the scene. Um, and I actually spent all morning this morning at the State Department talking about ex building experiential education models for foreign service officers on practical skills. Um, what's what's amazing to me is that there a lot of the Foreign Service Institute and and a lot of, and, and it's not just the institute; it's the way most educational institutions are structured. It's still PowerPoint, book, learn. Uh, and first of all, I, I, I probably would have gotten C's in all my classes if, if that's the only way that it would have been because I don't learn that way. And most people don't learn that way. I learn by doing. I learn by imagery. Um, and so what we're going to be doing now, and, and this is sort of the first foray into this, is looking at the easiest topic imaginable, religion. Um, that was sarcastic. Uh, and, and, and conflict and how our uh, foreign service actually engages with religious actors. And it's not just, here's how you engage with the religious actors. We are actually reverse engineering experiential simulations for uh, foreign service officers uh, that are going to train them towards the skills they need to engage with religious actors in conflict areas. So the good news is things are changing. The way that people are, are being educated, it's slow, but it's changing. And I think that it's a really positive change because that means that those people who are in positions of power uh, whether, I mean, these aren't going to be the EGAD ministers, but the American Foreign Service officers from their positions of power, they're not going to say, I didn't have the mediation skills, I didn't have the negotiation skills, I didn't, have, I didn't have the religious wherewithal to understand why I should or should not engage with this religious community in this way. Uh, they're going to say, you know, I would, the American government or whatever institution was smart enough to train me on this before, and I didn't make those mistakes. And, but I'm sure they'll make all new mistakes. But it's, it's still fine. It's a slow process. Um, so, so I'll end it there. Uh, and if anybody has any questions, I don't know how much time we have okay. since we are One running or two late. Questions. But I'm happy to answer any questions. Questions, commenters. Hi, I'm Paola. I come from Colombia, from La Universidad de los Andes, and my question is going to be like really personal. Through my experience I've had in life, I've had the possibility of being in a lot of models of UN. So I wanted to know, like, what you think about it, and do you see this as a positive thing or a negative Model thing? Model UNs? Yeah. I think they're great. I think they're great. Let people practice. Uh, that's how you, I mean, that's how I learn. And if that's how someone learns, they should really seek out those experiential education models. By the way, you go to a good university, too. Wonder, the guy who runs our Bologna Symposium is a graduate from uh, Los Andes.
my name is Yuda Trunkas, third year PhD student. Just qu one quick question for your trainings. Um, who are your applicants normally? Are they students or are they diplomats? Or do you even, um, mm -hmm. does it matter if you are a practicing diplomats or diplomat or you're trying to be one? Right, so the average age for our train, uh, the people who come to our trainings are 30 years old. Um, and we generally recruit from a very broad base, like I was saying. Um, so we have diplomats, we have people that work in the UN, we, we bring in military, uh, both on, on the national side and on the peacekeeper side, uh, PhD students, master's students, uh, and, and young professionals. Um, so it's, it's a really strong mix, journalists, uh, and it's, it's uh, 60 to 65 people from, from 40 to 45 countries, uh, usually, as we come in, and it's, it's a month long, 10 to 12 hours a day, very, very intense. Um, then we should invite you to Egypt for, <laughs> a, tra for a training session. Thank you very much. Please yeah. join me for thanking. Thank you. Thank you.